final session for today is titled Platform Strategy, The Changing Structure of Value Creation by Ross Dawson. Ross is a globally recognised as a leading futurist, keynote speaker, entrepreneur and authority on business strategy. He is a founding chairman of five companies, including leading future think tank, Future Exploration Network, and a best-selling author of books, including the acclaimed Live Networks, sorry, Living Networks. Strong global demand has seen him deliver keynote sessions in 27 countries, while frequent media appearances include CNN, Bloomberg, Sky News, ABC, Today, and the Sunrise Shows. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ross to the stage. So we live in exciting times. And one of the most important frames to think about this is platforms. Platforms are providing a mechanism, a structure, to be able to think about the way in which value creation is changing today. So I find as I look at this over the last uh, last year or two or three, is that platform thinking, platform strategy, brings together many of the themes that I've worked on for the last couple of decades in terms of knowledge-based relationships, uh, living networks, the social media inside and outside organizations, crowdsourcing. So today I want to look at two things. One is to look at the idea of platforms, why it's so relevant today, look at some details of the strategy and how we should think about that and creating value uh, for our organizations and also this idea of this exponential value because uh, in developed countries uh, companies large companies tend to think of double-digit growth as a as a something to be able to look for each year yet in a world of exponential technologies I think we should also look to the potential and the possibilities to be create exponential value and this needs to be a primary frame of the next phase of business so The, have this clicker working, please. Great. Right. So, if we currently today, we already see that this is an extraordinary proportion of values being created. So, of the largest 100 corporations in the world, 60 of them already have half of the value being created on platforms. Now, the important point to make, this is by market capitalization. If you do this by revenue, it would be a completely different measure because the market recognizes that that's where the potential for growth lies in terms of platforms, where we will see an larger and larger proportion of the largest organizations of the value being created being created in value in platforms. So what I want to look at uh, quickly this afternoon is looking at what are the shifts which are enabling this rise of platforms. Go on to look at the structure of platforms and how they work. Look at this transition to platforms across a whole array of industries, not just the most more obvious ones, but a whole array of different domains. Look at the elements and the fundamentals of strategy. How is it that we think about platform strategy to be able to create value? Look at this idea of scalability and how that can work in a platform world. Look at how organizations change. And finally, where this may take us leading forward. So looking, I suppose, as a summary of some of the shifts which are enabling this world of platforms. And pretty obviously, it's the world of connectivity. We are all connected as never before. And critically, that, that is through phones, where individuals have access to all this information wherever they are. So any of our participation in the economy can be enabled through these smartphones, where or we are looking to have two and a half billion more people have smartphones on the planet in the next five years. We have this shift to participation. And this is not just a way in which we are accessing social media, where we have over half the people on the planet on social media, uh, many of them uh, using social, uh, mobile social media platforms. So this is just the tools where we are participating. But this is also a mentality, a shift where we have grown to accept. We don't just go into shops and buy things. We are now active participants. We're actively creating value as well as sharing of value. So the tools are happening to be able to enable that, but also a shift in attitudes and mentality. There's also this shift to integration. And back we started a long time ago with EDI, going on to XML, the extensible markup language to allow more and more flows of information across boundaries, then new protocols, JSON and so on. But now we're essentially all technologies are built from the, the ground up to be able to integrate with other machines, with other systems, so that anything we do can 
flow across boundaries, across the organizations and how they work. And also the fact that we are seeing data is at the absolute core. So the increase in cost performance of data storage is 64% per year, taking it dramatically faster than Moore's law. So this, we have the explosion of the availability of extraordinarily low cost of data. We have the proliferation of sensors to be able to gather data. But now this also shifts, takes us to this idea of platforms at the core, where to make sense of that data, to analyze that, to be able to aggregate that data, requires something in the middle. And that's where the role of the platform can emerge. So moving on to the structure, the ultimate structure, and essentially platforms are multi-sided markets. Now the idea of these are almost always two-sided markets, where you have two sides. One as a network or a market of buyers, another a network or a market of sellers. Sometimes this extends a little bit beyond that to have some additional marks beyond that, but usually fundamentally bringing two markets together. This idea of two-sided markets is really just developed over the last dozen years, but that is what has been enabled by the world of connectivity. And so if we, whilst I don't usually like definitions, I think it is important to look at platforms and what they are. And I think a simple way of thinking about platforms is that they enable value-creating interactions between people who are outside. This external is absolutely critical. So this is a fundamental shift in what an organization is. People think about organizations traditionally as we create value. We create things which we sell and people want to buy because they're value. To an absolutely fundamentally different frame where an organization is now an enabler of other people creating value by the way in which they interact. And that is done by having an open infrastructure, something which many people can participate in, and some rules, some structure, some regulation, which define how value can be created in those platforms. So it is about those who create and those who use. And I, even though I don't use the, like the word consumer, it's still it's this idea of producing and consuming, but often being the same person. And this is across any number of domains. Absolutely in terms of products, absolutely in terms of services, in terms of content, in terms of uh, you know, apps, very obviously, money, capital, these are all domains. And in each case, there is somebody who is selling, there is somebody buying, there is somebody creating, there are so many things, and there's many examples, just a, there's just a tiny handful of the many, many platforms that are connecting on one side, those who produce on the other, those who consume value. So, in the structure of this, what is absolutely fundamental is this idea of positive feedback loops and the single heart of the positive feedback loops is that if there are more users, there is more value. And if there's more value for more users, that draws in and it creates this positive feedback loop. So this is not a new idea. W. Brian Arthur uh, built in term, uh, created all these ideas and increasing returns and path dependency back in 1993 beginning to frame this just at the dawn of the internet. And we've seen this, of course, this idea of network effects, network exter externalities. The more people there are, the more value is created. And to take a specific example, I mean, this very similar loop plays out and not just in Twitter, but many others in terms of saying, it is more attractive to use, you get more users, it means you get more developers. That's one part of the other side of the market. You get more applications, more better ecosystem, and drawing and increasing this positive feedback loop. In many ways in which you can frame that. So it's interesting to me that it's this business model canvas, which you may have seen, used extensively in startup world, even corporate world today. It has value, but it is fundamentally flawed because it does not take into account positive feedback loops, which is the heart of any valid business model today. You need to look at any business model, you say, how does this feed on itself? How is it that what do we create actually feeds on itself to grow? And if you're not having that frame, then you're not building a business model that is relevant in the world today. And of course, these positive feedback loops create very rarely winner takes all markets, but winners take most markets. And you can do mathematically modeling, so you depend on particular parameters around that, what degree you'll get, but commonly you'll get 80 to 85% for the largest participant in the market. Um, 
you know, around 10% for the second participant and so on. And it tends towards these kinds of markets when you get these effective feedback loops, though with the potential for shifts in those markets over time. But this is absolutely a dynamic where you don't get market share in a traditional market, but absolutely these winner take most markets. So what we're seeing is a shift, a transition across every industry that we can think of from traditional models to these platform models. And of course, when you say platforms, everybody thinks of Uber, which has uh, now valued well over $60 billion. And what it does is it matches not just the existing markets of drivers and people who want to be driven, but now all of these latent markets, these new ones that are arising. So because it is far more uh, flexible, because it means that anybody that has a relatively recent car and no criminal record become a driver, it creates vast new pools of people who are prepared to drive people around. And, which, and then on the other side, it creates more consumers because it's cheaper, because it's easier, because it's more effective, because it ties into their accounting systems easily. So being able to create these platforms that are creating value. And I think it's important to note that in fact, the Uber market in San Francisco exceeded the size of the entire taxi market in San Francisco three years earlier. And the taxi market still exists. This is creating new, bigger markets in addition to what we had before. Ooh, Airbnb, another example, of course, where people have physical space, uh, make that available to others don't, is now has a higher market capitalization than any hotel chain in the world. Now, this is just one of the fundamental shifts we've seen, but that's just look at a few of the examples of how that played out, absolutely in terms of media. And very interesting now, of the, we're not just seeing the challenges of news on paper and newspapers, but just in the last three to six months, people concerned about the new digital-only startup, media startups, such as BuzzFeed and Business Insider and so on, because the platforms for media, Facebook in particular, LinkedIn, or in the case of even Viber and Snapchat, are now media platforms dissemination. So media dissemination is happening almost extern uh, exclusively or largely on third-party platforms. So there's a fundamental view of how the media market works. Finance is increasingly becoming a platform. Rather than having the bank in the middle, it has been able to disintermediate. So a lending club in the US uh, as a peer-to-peer -peer lending institution has uh, you know, done well over $11 billion in loans, Australia well behind that. We're seeing these markets, the ability to have the producers and the consumers in terms of lending, in terms of capital, in terms of, for example, uh, currency exchange, currency fair, transfer wise. Again, these are matching pools. This has becomes a platform. The bank as an institution, which owns the balance sheet, can now be put totally aside. So Uber doesn't own the cars, Airbnb doesn't have the, the storage space, London Club doesn't have the balance sheets, we're able to push this out far more broadly. Homes are platforms, so Nest, of course, owned by Google, becomes part of the infrastructure within a home. We have platforms such as the Digital Living Network Alliance, which are ways in which you can connect all the participants. So this becomes, you know, again, a case study and strategy. The, every television vendor wants to become the platform to link together all of the device in the home. Every uh, set-top box manufacturer or hi-fi manufacturer or security system manufacturer. So there's this constant tension between those who are looking to be able to provide, integrate with others, but to also take more of the pie. And we'll come back to that in looking at the strategy. Fitness, or indeed the own product markets, Nike and Nike Fuel. These are platforms on a number of different levels. They're platforms for people to be able to create and to participate into the designs. The shops become platforms for communities. You're starting to get the platforms for sharing of information to integrate other third-party applications and developers. So again, these multi-sided markets where fitness and health become a platform. And this is not just in digital world. This is absolutely in physical world. Westfield is a great example of a platform. It is a platform, the Westfield Shopping Mall, where retailers come in and they participate in part of that pool of value creation. And they are there because there is this pool of people who are coming in shopping. Both sides benefit because it is a deeper pool on both sides. Now, clearly, any shopping mall has essentially the same model. We see more and more of the ways in which we're getting the information sharing, the information exchange, for example, done by 
Westfield in particular, which mean that we can absolutely look at retail as a platform. And those that are not doing retail as a platform are extraordinarily disadvantaged. Seeing Coca-Cola, for example, which is, of course, the secret recipe plus a whole lot of regional uh, bottle, uh, manufacturers and bottlers and distributors. And what many of them are doing are essentially using APIs to be able to give access to their marketing organization, to their supply chain, to give access to be able to participate in creating a platform for marketing rather than doing all the marketing themselves. Yes, there are some marketing geniuses in Coca-Cola, but they work with such a proliferation of external agencies and they have created the platforms, the <coughs> ecosystems, the information sharing, the information exchange to make this an effective platform. BMW is making the car into a platform with its connected drive system, with its own apps, with a whole lot of third-party apps, where again, this is the something in the middle, but it is enabling value through the participants on one side, clearly, by the people who are buying their car and driving it, the others who are the service providers to be able to bring that on top. We're seeing, in fact, in Australia, the, by some measures, the largest water trading platform in the planet is headquartered in Adelaide, Waterfind. Now they're just moving to California, which has some drought problems, to be able to facilitate that literal flow of water between where it has a higher value, where there's the ability to trade and exchange water. So this is where there is value from the platform. They're also moving into China, where again, getting these same issues. So the platform as an enabler for participation on both sides to be able to create a valuable market. So this is just a, a, an array, just an example of the fact where platforms are becoming so central for almost every facet of our economy. And this just requires that frame to understand it as the enabler of value creating interactions. And we can see that in every industry that is emerging. Yes, there are physical elements in some case. Yes, BMW creates cars and they go in machineries and they have a ton of, ton of steel and quite a lot of expensive electronics in them. But they're also, what makes them more valuable is the fact that there is a platform around it. So we're seeing these platform models emerge everywhere. And of course, blockchain is itself more a, an enabler of platforms than a platform itself. So blockchain enables anybody to create a platform. Blockchain, on top of that, Ethereum and so on, are all ways in which we can, anybody that has the, uh, the technological mouse can now create a platform which is inherently distributed, no central node, no central architecture, which can enable these value creating interactions across systems. And that is a fundamental essence of where we're seeing this acceleration and the shift of financial world to this platform world to where the fintechs are players because they understand this. So shifting to look at the strategy, if it's a world of uh, platforms, then let's look at how we need to be able to think about that to create the value. And I would say there's two primary things, again to emphasize, the focus is on external value creation. And I think there's many executives in Australia or in the world today that still need a bit of nudging or kicking or pushing or shoving to get their, get their head around it. This is not about, yes, we as an organization create value. This is how you enable others to create value, external value creation. And so it's a fundamental shift and does require organizations to change what they do. But I would also argue that a fundamental aspect of this of scalability. Because looking back, we saw that platforms are about this positive feedback loop. If you do not engage that positive feedback loop, it's broken. It will never work. You're going to be the, the loser takes the least instead of the winner takes the most. So in a way, all platforms must be designed to have this scalability. And I believe that there's potential in many cases to for that arguably unlimited, not to go, with, to go beyond the original scope of what you are creating. So if we look at what are the key elements of platform, the first thing is discovery. So if, for example, you are a freelancer.com, you're going in, you want to find a worker, the only thing, reason it works is you can actually find the right person to be able to do your work. In the case of the you know, Uber, it is being able to find the driver who is local to you, who is be able to do the service for you. In every case, in Airbnb, is again, be able to make sure that you can discover and find the right match. 
and of course being able to facilitate the transactions beyond that. Now, in order to make that happen, you require some governance structures. And there's a few elements to that. One of them is defining who is it that participates. So, for example, Uber says uh, it's, your car has to be at least than, less than nine years old or whatever it is, and you can't have a criminal record. All right, that's very simple, but that is a parameter. That's what defines whether you can participate. In other cases, there are far stricter things. So Expert 360, Sydney based global platform for expert workers, for professional workers. And I was just chatting to somebody the other day who was complaining because he'd applied to Expert 360 to be on the platform as a professional and they turned him down. Uh, so they have their own parameters around who they choose to participate in that platform. To be able to have some guidance, some structure around how value is shared, who gets the value within the, the thing. So for example, in Uber Pool, which you have in the Bay Area, not yet in Australia, is where a number of different people go on a ride together because you're all going in pretty much the same direction. You're having some mechanisms, some structures for how people are rewarded within that. And you know, also the regulation and the rules and the structures. And two key enablers. One is that of trust. And so reputation measures are absolutely fundamental. So again, if you, it's not on Uber, it's not just that uh, you rate the driver, the drivers also rate you as a customer. And if you don't get high enough ratings as a customer on Uber, no, no driver is going to pick you up. It's a two-sided market in terms of the reputation, to be able to create the trust. But absolutely in terms of, uh, you know, that was one of the key issues that eBay started off with working. How do we make sure that we can, you know, if you send some money, that we actually get the product in the form, form that we wanted? And so these have been developed over some time. There is a deep science around reputation measures, which is a fundamental enabler of trust, but also user experience. And because this is what enables this fluidity to be able to happen. So I, I think a very important case in point is Tinder. We have had dating apps for so long, and this is a perfect two-sided market, where people want to get together and they want to discover the person who will be the right person for them to get together with. They want to you know, have a, whatever form of transaction that, that comes out of that. But it was only when Tinder create, cracked that user experience. It is such hard work to go in to create your profile. Am I saying the right things? This uh, issue of being able to search through other pe people's pro profile, read between the lines and so on. So Tinder, clean all that, saying just one simple swipe enables you to then participate in this matching. Now, you may think that that de degrades or depreciates the value of that interaction, but the reality was that was an enormous facilitator of this dating platform, this ex user experience being beautiful, clean, easy, and swift. So there's five elements of platform strategy. We won't be able to go into them all in detail. I'd like to run through these quickly and then just give a couple of examples which will illustrate that. So we've already talked, I think, about most of these fundamental pr uh, principles, enabling value, creating interaction between others, positive feedback loops, encouraging external innovation. How do you find other people to be able to create the opportunities for value creation? Then when you are looking to set up a platform, and there's two ways to be able to do this. One is from scratch. The other is as an existing corporation, be able to look at how you shift part of your business model to, uh, to a platform strategies. So looking at what are the nature, uh, is it a pure marketplace? Is it a pure two-sided marketplace? What is the role of facilitation? Are you aggregating value? For example, is it as in a Kickstarter or in a, a Wikistrat, which is a, a platform for expert people to be able to provide a condensed expert opinion? Uh, there is a choice, and this is a, one of the issues around how this all plays out. Do you have a single owner of the platform? Do you have multiple owners? Because if there's a single owner who comes from the industry, people will um, you know, be very cautious about that. You know, and this is playing out in terms of some of the black blockchain uh, platforms, such as R3 at the moment, where we're seeing this caution around how much you can, um, you know, this ideas around, do you invest this with a single owner, or do you choose to have multiple owners? And uh, there's a whole history behind this of standards. Again, taking an interesting example, you know, of Bluetooth. Ericsson developed Bluetooth, and at a certain point, 2002 or so, they threw that out as open source. 
and that then enabled everyone to get on board and maybe to essentially create this as a platform for value creation in various guises. Choosing who comes in, the boundaries of ecosystem collaboration. Looking to that, then designing. So we're looking at the positioning, be able to design, how do you create the value? What are the governance structures? Where is the transparency? Where is the uh, information flows? Where do you stop that? And addressing these potential for negative feedback loops. Because yes, there are positive feedback loops, but there also can be negative ones. So for example, uh, if somebody rents out a place on Airbnb and throws a wild party, everybody that comes to that party says, awesome idea, I'm gonna go do that as well. And you create these feedback loops where you get more and more of these parties being thrown in uh, Airbnb places and this destroys the ecosystem as people don't want to put their systems on more, neighbors don't like it, and sort of a whole lot of negative loops being engaged. So you need to be able to understand and address those and look at how value creation can be focused on the individual. So looking at again at the, what are the capabilities, then again platform strategy. Part of it is orchestration. So Zara is you know, one of the great stories in fast fashion. It originated fast fashion. But today you don't need to have the, all of the extraordinary resources of Zara to be able to become a fast fashion retailer. You can go to a company like Li and Fung, based out of Hong Kong, who's as a platform, all they do is they get a whole lot of retailers, thousands and thousands of suppliers who they orchestrate in all of these complex supply networks to be able to bring those together. And that's the skill where they're taking extraordinary value and being able to match that in the middle. Managing communities, creating value for communities, encouraging participation, recognizing users as you would on Upwork or Freelancer or 99designs where they say, this is a wonderful person who's on our platform. Go buy from them, use them. You're actually creating as much value as possible for the participants in the platform because that creates value for the platform itself. Reputation measurement looked at and also data gathering because this is where there's so much value at the hub is being able to find, to gather that data, create value for the users as a result of that. And finally, designing for growth in terms of being able to, there's many incentives for single side, for being able to take a single side of the market or grow that on both sides. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. To promote participants, to support interactions, and to be able to design how it is that you will extend the platform beyond its original remit. So, um, and there's, you know, for example, freelancer.com, so Sydney-based listed company, one of the largest work platforms in the world, and they have grown not just by acquisition, since the original acquisition of freelancer.se out of Sweden, but also by being able to extend into new domains and new structures. So one example, which is, I suppose, a long-standing case study, is you know, what was described as the Twitterverse. This dates from 2010, this particular diagram, and that was when there was this rich ecosystem around Twitter in terms of third-party platforms, in terms of all sorts of different uh, value add around that, Twitter search, for example, uh, influence management, uh, whole, you know, collaboration tools, a whole rich ways of plugins and add-ons and rich ways to be able to enhance the Twitter uh, ecosystem. Now, Twitter, actively encouraged that from the start, from their foundation in 2006, being able to grow this participation. Yet at a certain point, they closed down. So they did acquire some of them uh, for TweetDeck, for example, uh, the Twitter search uh, facility, and a few other ones. Other ones, they basically said, no, we want to own that ecosystem. We don't want a third party interface because that creates too much of the value. So this comes down to the, so, we could debate for a long time as to whether those were the appropriate moves. Certainly, I think the consensus in the Twitter users is that they destroyed a lot of value by how they closed, tried to close their ecosystem. But these were fundamental strategic decisions they were making. And you can analyze in detail, and I suppose this is a case study, between one of some of those fundamental choices. Where, and the, the, the fundamental question there is, yes, even though you are enabling value creation outside the organization, they're still part of the value creation you are doing yourself. So that's part of the issue, the fundamental strategic issue is that choice. What do we do inside and what do we do outside? And arguably, the more that you try to take on, yes, that's valuable, we want to take that, we want to take that, we want to take that, that breaks down the, the, the 
premise in a way of it actually being a platform to coming back to the traditional view of the organization. So there's this delicate balance which needs to be managed. This little visual shows some of the founders, original people in PayPal, the PayPal Mafia, and some of the things which they spun off since then. So there's a few uh, well-known people like Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, uh, Dave McClure, David Sachs, and so on, who have gone on to do extraordinary things with companies like Yammer and Tesla and uh, Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and so on. And I suppose that I'm putting that there because there's so many platform strategy stories within that. One of the first one was that, in fact, PayPal was a, a side business originally with uh, Max Levchin and Peter Thiel. And Eventually, they started to see that it was getting more traction than the original idea, but they still struggled with getting the traction. And at a certain point, what made it work was they said, if you sign up for a PayPal account, you've got $10 free. And so that's when they, that was this thing, where they made this offer and they were able to make that pay off over time. But there was this, this issue then saying, well, we have a two-sided market. You've, in this case, you've got vendors and you have people who, who buy us. And we need to be able to create on one side a sufficient market size for the other side to grow. And that's one of the challenges with these two-sided markets. You, you can't have one without the other. So this issue of how do you create the incentives, and you can design various incentives beyond that, and be able to create that on another side. And you know, LinkedIn, for example, where it's shifting to be able to become a platform, not just a, in a way, a pure social network, to shifting to become a content market. So a platform where people can share professional content and to be able to share in that, to be able to come essentially shift their strategy from being a social platform to a content platform. So scalability is a fundamental view. And back, I've, it's, I've just celebrated my 20th anniversary since I was employed by a uh, corporation. And just at that time was the same time that Bill Gross set up a company called Idea Lab which is set up over 100 companies. They've had over 30 exits from that, uh, founder of many businesses. And this is what I thought of at the time as a parallel entrepreneur model. This idea of the serial entrepreneur is somebody that does a startup, they do another startup, and then they do another startup. So that's a serial entrepreneur, a parallel entrepreneur that does them all at the same time. And that's what I always thought, yes, that's what I want to do. I don't want to limit myself to any single thing. And they were seeing more and more of these models proliferate all over time. And now the phrase which is more often used is that of the, the company builder model. So there's two variables here. One is that you finance these ventures with capital of some kind, either your own capital or external capital, or you fund it by cash flow. And you can also use either your own ideas or other ideas. So Bill Gross of Idea Lab, every single thing they've done is his own idea. So he's just got so many ideas that he eventually says, all right, well, I want to do more, more than one of those. So these different models. So the classic one is, okay, you've got some capital and you want to facilitate other people's ideas. So these are accelerators, incubators, similar things where you're enabling this multiple companies to happen. Other people's ideas using a chunk of capital. You then can fund the same sort of thing by uh, cash flow. So interestingly, in our Sydney, we have Blue Chili, which has started off very much with that cash flow from startup services, being able to fund a whole set of businesses. Polonizer at one uh, time had a similar model. You have then the parallel entrepreneur, where you use your own ideas, but uh, your own capital. So I was a little while ago visiting uh, San Francisco and interviewed the CEO of uh, Monkey Inferno. So you may recall the story, one of the, the early social, um, social networks um, was, uh, sorry, just the name escaped me. It sold for a billion dollars, and they bought it back for a million dollars from AOL. Uh, the name will come back to me in a moment. And they now he has a billion dollars and is looking to do what to do with that. And so they're creating, at the same time, using his own money, these parallel entrepreneurial ventures. And they are, they are, now we have more and more startup studios where essentially, you know, often the agencies, which are doing things for clients, they make some cash flow, and they may build their own apps or build things. So more and more of these venture models which play out are on different ways to be able to create these multiple organizations at the same time. So it was recently faculty at uh, Singularity University in Silicon Valley talking about crowdsourcing 
and Kola Basalam Ismail there, who's the uh, executive director, who recently came out with a book called Exponential Organizations. This idea of how is it that we build organizations can actually be exponential. And these are the points which he brought out, and I, and I recommend the book, it's a, it's a great foundation for that. And I think some of the ideas are, again, this staff on demand, this ability to tap external crowds, build those together, use data effectively, engage well, use dashboards to be able to manage those. And I suppose looking at what I've been doing, so in our Advanced Human Technologies group has set up five companies, and I've also looked at around 50, 60 different models of these company builders. And what I see at the heart of this is really some core capabilities and core functions that you have to have at the center to be able to run these multiple businesses at the same time, to have a clear process for startups, to be able to um, you know, do the growth hacking, to be able to allocate resources effectively between your management projects, to be able to track metrics, reusable software modules. These are all the common things we see in these company builder models, which means you set up a whole lot of ventures, you have success criteria, is this something we continue with, you build the teams effectively, and some of them spin off. So you get external capital on them, they become another venture in their own right. And so you need to have this flow of lessons learned and data between each of those individual startups so that you are continuing to build your capabilities and your core functions. Now, this only works if you can draw in the talent and you can draw in the external funding to be able to drive these things. And clearly, the success that you have in your spin-offs is going to be able to drive this and be able to drive the brand, which will attract the talent and the fund to be able to take. So again, pretty clearly, we're moving to these positive feedback loops, which enable this uh, ability to be able to drive multiple ventures, multiple scalable ventures, this idea of the expansion or un unlimited growth. So if we look at organizations, all organizations must be given not just on building internal networks, but external networks, you know, and shifting to this external focus. So every function inside the organizations need to rethink what they do. The finance needs to rethink itself. IT, HR, Supply chain, they all become quite different functions in an organization, in an economy that is driven by platforms. So part of this is by APIs. So Chris Saad, Australian actually, is the head of APIs at Uber, uh, but you're also seeing APIs from FedEx, from UPS, from Telstra, from uh, Westfield, from any number of organizations that are saying this is a fundamental enable. We're giving access to information, we're allowing participation in our information flow by how we work this. Interestingly, framed by uh, Jeffrey Parker, and I should note that if a great reference point if, is uh, there's three gentlemen, Jeffrey Parker, Ma uh, Marshall Van Alston, and Sangeet Chowdhury, who've just come out with a book called Platform Revolution, which is uh, it's pretty clearly the reference point in this space. But one of the things with which uh, Jeffrey and Marshall pulled together is this way of how Jeff Bezos describes how things need to work within Amazon. So he says, all teams, if you're a team within Amazon, you've got to make everything you do accessible to other people inside the organization. And that's the, pri the primary way in which you have to interact. So you, you, you have to have these clear processes whereby anybody inside the organization can access what you're doing. And these must be externalizable. That is that it's not just to allow anybody inside the organization, but anybody outside the organization must be able to do that. So he is saying our organization is a platform in how it works. It is a fractal in a way. It is not just Amazon itself that has these APIs to enable externally. Every module, every element, every team inside Amazon is itself its own platform to be able to enable this platform value creation within Amazon and beyond. So if we look at the future, I think pretty fundamentally, who are shifting to a world where value creation will come from platforms. Now, you may say, what is the, you know, this sounds like sharing economy and on-demand commodity and collaborative consumption. And yes, this addresses pretty much the same frames. But the reason why the focus on platforms is that these sharing economy only happens if somebody designs an effective platform. These things don't happen by accident. They happen through leadership. So being able to think, about the platform that enables the sharing economy, that enables the hybrid of consumption is the primary frame. And understanding the strategy that allows that is a fundamental to be able to allow this to happen. Healthcare must become a platform and be able to allow this flows of information, the flows of value creation, the flows of participation. Education 
We've seen Udacity, edX, Coursera, and so on, our platforms for uh, education content. We absolutely need to see that as part of schools, where we have platforms for peer-to-peer peer learning between people who have similar ways of thinking, similar ways of profile around the world. And again, again, shift from institutional value creation to extended value creation across boundaries. Cities, and so Sydney, Melbourne, other cities in Australia. So they are not innovators per se. They are platforms for innovation. And the New South Wales government, the city of Sydney, all of the participating government, participants, all of us, They'd be able to say, how is it that we can think about a city as a platform? A platform that enables value creating interactions. And there's a whole set of ways in which this frame starts to be able to create something which is truly valuable from that. And finally, I would argue that government must become a platform. It is now an institution. We pay our tax dollars, government spends their dollars wisely, possibly, or unwisely, more likely. So now then what we need to do is frame government can become completely different. It becomes a platform to allow value creating interaction within society where we can create the best society we want far more efficiently than we do with our existing government structures. So I've looked at the shifts, the structure of platforms, the transition of platforms, strategy, scalability, shifting organizations in the future. I think you'll agree that we are moving to a world which is becoming exponential, which is becoming scale, which is creating enormous, plat enormous possibilities from this frame of platforms. And I look forward to seeing what you create from this world of platforms. Thank you. It was Bebo. Bebo. Thank you, Ross. Um, can we take a couple of questions? It must be burning. So, platform economics is the name of the game. Any questions from the floor? Now, I'll just start with one then, uh, Ross. Um, some might say that Australia is somewhat conservative and um, we look at privacy and security a little bit more conservative way. So when we start to say things are scaling and, and exponentially growing, um, how do you see that working out in Australia if we're seen to be conservative with data flows? These, these are constraints. So if we look at, we always need to design around constraints. There are hard constraints and there are soft constraints. And I think that Part of this is the social values we have. And if there are regulation which is set up, or there are things where we are basically infringing on social attitudes, then we need to be able to design within them. But those are something which we can do once we recognize those as, as rele uh, relevant constraints. But I think that to a certain degree, these are soft constraints in the sense that we can start to shift the, the ways in which we think about things in order to be able to create value. There is, we object to our loss of privacy unless there is sufficient commensurate value creation for us as individuals. And that's one thing which has not played out well. Organizations generally, media, financial, uh, health, and others have not played that game well uh, in terms of they have not ever tried to clearly demonstrate the value of the, the, value, the data which they're gathering. So I think we may have already, locked, the horse may have already bolted, but I think that doesn't mean that we can't do this. It simply means these are design parameters, which means that we need to can design uh, platforms of value creation considering those attitudes and considering that regulation. Fantastic, thank you. Question. Hi, thanks. Alex Sahad of Reut again from ITY. I was just wondering, which country do you think will uh, take on government as a platform first? The US, Australia? Uh, Eastern Europe, uh, East Asia, where do you think it might be? Uh, well, we're already seeing Estonia has in many ways adopted uh, many of these principles, implemented blockchain, for example, a uh, number of the verification of birth certificates and uh, I think a few other uh, certification processes. And it's, it seems to, you know, in many ways, to be the, in the vanguard and be able to do that. There's, there's some. The, there have been a number of edicts in the United States. The White House basically says that every government agency must be able to provide open data facilities and have an architecture to be able to enable that. That still hasn't gone as far as it should, but it's still that kind of mandate has facilitated uh, at least the elements of open data which can facilitate that. And there's, there's hundreds of apps which have been created by third parties to be able to use that effectively. Britain as well, I think there is, there's some good thinking in Britain, uh, which 
So the the frame civil society is being used extensively in the UK, which which is analogous to what I've been talking about, this idea that we participate in creating the society which we want. So it's not exactly the same thing, but I think the UK, uh, both a lot of, a lot of the non-NGOs in Britain have embraced quite similar thinking and have been quite close to both of the major parties there. So I think that there's, uh, there's certainly some good reference points there as well. There's also economic doomers and gloomers who think that you know the US has got 19 trillion in debt, which they can never pay back, and that there will be you know some sort of global economic reset at some point, and uh, potentially soon, which would be a horrible thing. I hope it doesn't happen. But do you think the platforms are going to evolve fast enough to sort of get ahead of this financial fiat currency turmoil to somehow save us? Like technology will save us before we blow ourselves up in some sort of nuclear catastrophe or economic catastrophe befalling us. Do you think that the you know the technology will help us to come up with like you know the Bitcoin of the future, these digital currencies which will give us equality in government and finance and you know help this revolution keep going forward and not put us back into the Stone Ages? Uh, well I think you could ask the same question in like twenty different ways, as in essentially will we be able to use our imagination and technologies to be able to beat the you know, many of the, the negative forces that we have also created. And the jury's out. I mean, that's the, my role as a futurist is to be able to shape that conversation in a way, to whatever degree I can, to be able to make people aware of some of the very negative potential worlds that we might move into, and also the potentials for to be able to make things better so that we can make, do, take the action now which will veer us more towards those positive futures. So I don't know, to be completely frank. Uh, I am, tend to be an optimist. Uh, well, I am I'm deeply an optimist. And so I think that, yes, I think the answer is yes, but I don't think that is a given. And I think we d that it depends on us taking concerted collective action, doing the things that we need to, to shift us towards those positive outcomes that will enable that to happen. Because there are some scary scenarios out there, I absolutely agree. Do we have one last question? Ray Whitehead. Um, with what you're talking about, you require uh, or it's predicating an open society, open data sets, um, open information. What we're currently seeing is a move by predominantly conservative first world government um, against that um, with the rise of, of you know, terrorism and and other threat which largely are overstated to what the threat actually is and they're using that as a as an excuse to scale back um, the extent of openness but you're also seeing from these same um, first world governments wanting to monetize you know the people's information which, uh, where do you see all of these things coming together? Because if governments try to control information and monitor through either monetarization or just basically putting walls up, the, the whole platform idea starts to fall apart because you, you, then, you then add, um, I suppose, unknowns into it and extra costs. Um, yeah, and controls which go against the growth yeah. and positive feedback for platforms. So I guess part of this is the broader trends. And I think it is, I wouldn't quite say predicated on open data and information. It is, I, I would suggest both it is enabled by and also uh, pushing towards open data. So because we start to see more and more value being created in more open systems, that will be a tendency across, particularly in the business sector, and we would hope uh, health, education, and so on to be uh, to this more open systems. It's still possible to create platforms without fully open systems, and I think there's, we do need to have the governances again. Where is information shared and where is it not shared? These are the decisions which need to be made. So I do absolutely agree that there are some uh, things which are happening at the government level in terms of privacy and encryption and sharing which are pushing against that. 
Uh, I don't necessarily see that there's a fundamental disablers of the, the, what I'm describing. Uh, they are disablers, yes, but not at a fundamental level. And I think that part of, again, I, I don't have a cl crystal clear answer. This is part of the uncertainty in how things will flow, flow forward. And I think that's one of the significant factors, but I think that the underlying shift towards this value created in more open systems is one which is not going to be undone by what we're seeing from uh, governments at the moment. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Ross for his presentation this afternoon. That concludes our day. Thanks so much for attending. We hope you've got a lot out of today's sessions. Just a reminder to complete the online survey, um, downloadable by the app. Not for all pres presenters, their presentations will be made available by a link um, sometime next week, but only for those who have completed their survey. So please take the time to do that.